love struck Romeo, he's got a serenade Laying everybody low With a love song that he made He finds the street light He steps out of his shade Say something like You and me, babe How about it? Juliet says, hey, it's Romeo You nearly gave me a heart attack He's underneath the window She's singing, hey, love, my boyfriend Shouldn't come around here singing other people like that. Anyway, what you gonna do about it? Julian, the dice was loaded from the start, and I bet you exploded in my heart. When you're gonna realize it was just time was wrong, Juliet. Romeo and Juliet is the song that was played live by Mark more than 1,000 times actually and it still remains in his live set list, making it one of the, if not the most played, his song ever. Remember, at one show you usually hear the song once, so it means he played it every day for three years straight. And this, especially being a rough approximation, is quite impressive. From what I understand, this classic song even beats the almighty Sultans on Swing in that respect. Because Mark drops Sultans occasionally, but he just couldn't stop playing Romeo. Even his guitar gave up already, and he's still playing the song. So you can say Mark loves it, and so do we. First, the basics. Yes, it's an open G tuning. Yes, Mark usually plays it with the band and on a different type of a guitar. It has a couple on third fret, everybody knows that. Let's start with the chord shapes. This is the important song, so I'll be unusually detailed here. Open G tuning is probably the easiest open tuning in existence, because D, G and B strings stays like in standard tuning, and other strings goes down just one whole step. Very easy to tune, very easy to understand. Romeo and Juliet, being one of Mark's earliest songs, is not a particularly complicated song chord-wise. In fact, it, it's only five chords, like in Sultans of Swing. It's just the open tuning that makes it look like a difficult piece. But the first chord shape is actually just D. The first string goes up a whole step. The rest is like in the D with A in the bass chord shape. This is the shape I've probably discussed 50 times already, because Mark uses it, uses it all the time. D with A in the bass, adjusted for the open G tuning. This is your basic A shape, adjusted for the new tuning again. This is all that's left from the standard G shape. The easiest one yet. Next is B minor. Capo make it sound like D minor, taken straight from the Sultan's Reef. 
Again, bass goes up the whole step and we're done. This is the chord a lot of people are trying to play with an open B string. But I don't know. It sounds terrible to me. Yes, the notes are right, but the sound is awful. It sounds too busy, if that's a word. So the proper way to play it is to mimic the real D minor. Mm, three fingers in a row and the first finger up here. This is harder to grip, but sounds so much better. Good thing is that from the D it's easy to get to B minor through the third finger. makes it for a good exercise. The tricky bit is to mute the 6th string with the tip of the 2nd finger and mute the 1st string with the 1st finger. I, I always tell, tell the beginners, learn how to mute strings properly because this could be the easiest way to spot a beginner when he plays, say, a C chord and never even try to mute the thickest string. So it's been D, A, G, B minor, only one chord left, and it's a in E minor. We can try to play it like in standard tuning. But the way Mark plays it always, because it's the only rational way to do it, is with two fingers like that. Same thing as with the B minor with open B. It sounds strange if you add the E bass, which is the root note. But again, it sounds terrible because it's too easy to underpress it with the palm. And it's too easy to mess it with the first finger as well. It sounds terrible and too busy, so there's only one solution, which is open fifth string bass and the rest. Which actually makes it E minor with G in the bass chord. But this way you'll play it clean each time. It's a trade-off, but it happens with open tunings. That's why they call it odd tunings, I guess. Just kidding. So all the five chords are D with A in the bass, A, G, B minor, E minor with G in the bass. This is all you need to learn to proceed with the song, seriously. From what I can tell, here on YouTube, people usually play this song pretty accurate, but some nuances get lost here and there. I've already discussed B minor and E minor quirks, but I love the nu nuances. I truly believe that the devil is in the details, so I'll talk about my favorite parts in the song. Little hidden gems, which I rank as a little songwriting masterpieces within the main masterpiece, which is the song Romeo and Juliet we all love and want to play. It's hard for me to discuss the finger picking patterns in the introduction because there is so many ways to play it as with any finger picking tune each time you hear Mark play it, it sounds a little different because 
you can alternate bass. You can repeat the bass. space to breathe the only way to play the song as interesting as it deserves is to learn every single variation but the version I played at the start is a combination from like 10 versions all the way from 1980 to 21st century. I'd say if you're not familiar with this, learn how to strum the song first and then try to finger pick it. Because for playing the intro, you have to be deeply connected with the context of the song, how it feels and develops. So I'll do it right now and go through each section just brushing with the thumb, starting with the intro. And this is the whole song, five chords, as I said. It repeats and everything else is in amazing, amazing details. The first hotspot is this ingenious six string line connecting D with the G through the A chord. It's one of the most enjoyable feels I've ever played in my life. It's so beautiful it even forces Mark to use four fingers, which is a rare thing for his playing, but it's so enjoyable. Palm, 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 index, middle, ring, pull off, index. thing to point out is it's very important to do a pull off in the left hand immediately completely change the whole chord here only then it's going to sound fluent and beautiful I remember picking it out when I was 15 or 16 I played something like this It's much easier just to switch the chord completely. Anyway, another little bit is this turnaround from from A back to D, and I mean this. I mean this little note on the first string played by index finger. sort of 
ties the two parts together more beautiful than if you just go without it. Because it sounds just like the line before and not connecting anything. Of course in the song it is barely noticeable, but it is there. Now the verse. Also, this beat with open strings it sounds almost like the feel I mentioned before, but it cuts earlier. I love how Mark always plays it with the melody note first and then the bass, as opposed to. This syncopation. I was shocked it gets unnoticed by so many peep players out there. To me, it's one of the best parts in the whole song. So enjoyable to play. I can't stress that enough. Playing this song is like a therapy. Maybe that's why Mark loves it so much. Of course, many things happen in the chorus. Uh, first, I want to point out this. It's important not to overdo it with chords. In fact, the best way to accompany yourself is to use as little chords as possible. To this point, I only played like this, but here is the over-the-top example. sounds too complicated, much better to do it in a more subtle way. Check out how little chords I use and make it sound more interesting. Mm. Ben's job to flesh it up and play all these incredible harmonies. In this song every part is interesting. The bass creates some slash chords, rhythm guitar plays interesting drone feels, you know, beautiful piano playing. As I'm here anyway, another little thing that keeps being missed by a lot of people um, here after E minor. <laughs> This D chord which lasts like for a millisecond. But it's there, it adds the overall sound so much. Compare it if I just go straight from E minor to G. Mm. The 
this is one place where overdoing it you actually help it sound better so there's no rules anywhere here but if you sing it to play at the same time like it's supposed to keep it simple so you won't screw up both parts I think everyone can agree on that the point I'm trying to make here is that if you're going to play a song for more than 1000 times for millions of people like Mark do it's not like you can get away with playing it half-hearted not knowing exactly what you're going to play the way I analyze the song is I'm constantly asking questions like which is the best way to play this line or where should I simplify it so it will be harder to make mistake and despite some criticism I get from my voice I always sing the song as with the song Money for Nothing or in fact with any song from 50 songs I covered before this is always the case Mark have a lot to say so the song to me isn't full if you don't sing it as we Russians say you can throw a word out of a song and I can't imagine performing Romeo and Juliet without singing it's like a book with blank pages you have to tell that story and the guitar is only a part of it I can sing Paul Simon songs but another outstanding feature about McLaughlin songs is that you don't need to be Frank Sinatra in order to play it and I love the song so much I hope you liked my take on it thank you so you love struck Romeo he's got a serenade Laying everybody low